Good morning and welcome to Bob's Coffee Chat. Today we have Bob Crane, Marketing and Sales Director at Fix Your Tax Problem Incorporated. He's going to show us how to create extreme client loyalty that lasts a lifetime. Bob has a 15 year career history in sales and marketing. He specializes in programs that include personal and business planning designed to keep you on the road to success. So Bob, how can we transform our clients into repeat customers and raving fans? Very good question. So uh, I'm in my second business. My first business was from 1977 until 1996. And that was a tour company over on the island of Kauai, where I ran kayak trips up rivers and down coastlines and had hotel beach concessions where I, if you came down to the beach, we would be, um, you know, showing you around and giving you the gear and giving you lessons and putting kind of the uh, beach concession concierge approach on you. So I did that for 18 years. This is my second business. And um, unlike the kayaking tour business, in the kayaking business, you were up the creek and we gave you a paddle. In the tax resolution business, you're up the creek and you need a paddle and we have to provide one again. So this is, this is Fix Your Tax Problem, of course, is the second business. We've been in that one for 23 years. Um, extreme loyalty that lasts a lifetime, the dream of having a client that will be there forever as long as you run your business. Uh, so let's get this going there. So the first question I wanna ask you is what business are you in? My, my thought is, oh gosh, I'm in the tax business when that was asked of me. Well, not really. I'm really in the client intimacy business. What is that? What's client intimacy and why is it important? If we're in the referral business, why would Bob or Sandra refer a client to me? They would not unless it first started with trust. And as you can see, reaching up to someone to pull you up, you sure hope they've got a nice grip on you when you're trusting them. If you don't have trust with your client, you're not going to get loyalty. It's the first thing that has to occur. Here's an example of a typical tax problem client that we have. 10 years ago, they were referred to us. And if you look over here, this is their testimonial on our website. When they came, they felt beaten down and angry and overwhelmed. They owed the IRS $70,000. And they were a blended family. One was a therapist, self-employed, and one was a W-2 teacher. And they just got way behind and owed. When they did their evaluation with us, they got their minds put at ease and they had a sense of hope, a little light at the end of the tunnel because we had a plan that said, you're our normal client. This looks horrible to you. We do this every day. On a scale of one to 10, you're about a four. Oh, really? A four? <gasps> okay, that's hopeful. We worked with them to get rid of these bad habits of not filing on time, not preparing their bookkeeping, and not being organized so that they could prepare. We ended up using an IRS offering compromise program and settled their 70,000 and the IRS accepted 500 and closed that case. They're quite happy with us. We've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of offers and compromise over the past 23 years. One of the things that was great after they got over the shock of, are they really going to accept $500 and 70,000? is this really true, is um, they, they began to think differently about their money, about their business, about their organization skills, and we helped change that for them. Now, we didn't just stop there and say, thanks for doing business with Fix Your Tax Problem. We went over here and for the last five years, they've been on our program to convert them from late and non-filers to early bird filers. If you file your tax return and give us your information by March 15th so we can file before April 15th, you'll be an early bird and we'll give you 20% off the tax fee. How about that? A reward for being prepared and for getting this great behavior to keep you from falling back into old patterns. So 
they're one of our many early birds now that we give a discount to, and they're excited to get their tax returns done before April 15. Okay, hearing versus listening. What's the difference between hearing and listening? Your client has got to feel like you get them, that you understand them. And so we listen to a client and when we put them on a Zoom meeting and we're filling out an evaluation, most of my clients first 10 minutes starts with a horrible story, something that happened to them, a life event, accident, injury, illness, death in the family, natural disaster, breast cancer, some series of horrible, unexpected things threw them off their financial gain. It caused the tax problem and financial problems. When they're telling their story, it is really very emotional for them. They don't share this information with anybody and they don't wanna reach into that box of old problems because their divorce is in there or their breast cancer is in there or the loss of their business is in there. But we gotta go into that box and bring out the information we need to fix their tax problem. So when you write somebody's story down in front of them and you ask them questions, are these all the horrible things that happened to you? How do you feel about it? And then you ask them, would you like this to be over? And would you like a fresh start? They get it that we get it. And getting gotten, understanding your clients and having them know that you know something personal about them is really important. What are the levels of communication? Number one, the first level is a level of fine. Hi, Sandra. How's the wife, the dog, the kids? Fine, 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 fine. Good to see you, Bob. Bye. Then there's the second level of, of communication, association. Hey, I'm going to see the Giants and the A's this weekend. It's the first time that baseball's back in full. <gasps> you like the A's? No, no, no. I like the Giants. Oh, I like the Giants too. Great. We have something in common. We're associating. It's a little deeper communication. Then you have humor. If you can get someone to laugh, it stops the facade and they, it breaks them down into their normal, their normal person. Humor is a very good and deeper part of communication. However, if you can get to four feelings, when somebody tells you how they feel, you are truly monitoring that person. You are inside that person. You're getting something from them. So when we're questioning people, we get to feelings. A lot of times people will cry on the phone when they're telling their back tax story. I'm used to that. I make it okay. It's a safe place to talk. And they're embarrassed by it. And I say, no, it's normal. My wife asks me every day, how many people did you make cry today, Bob? It's part of getting to the feelings of letting people get their stuff out so they feel gotten. Hearing is what you get checked by your doctor. Listening is not hearing. Listening, you have a choice of being interesting or being interested. Interesting, let me tell you all about myself. When I'm listening to your problem, you don't need to hear very much about me. Interested is I need to know everything about you that I can to help you with the problem you've hired me for. If I'm interested, I'm learning a lot about you and I'm not talking a lot about me. Listening is done with your mind. It is not done with your ears. And you can't help when you're listening, but do interpretation. And you interpret things of what they're saying and what they mean and what they might mean and what they don't mean. And you have to be very, very, very careful about forming conclusions while you're interpreting what you're listening to. There's a great book out called Positive Intelligence, and it's got a free test to test your positive intelligence and what your top saboteurs are. There are nine of them, your top three. And they have a a description of trying to be a curious anthropologist when you're first meeting someone and learning about them. And a curious anthropologist might go into a village where they've never seen anyone before like us. And they might go in with their bag of technology and phones and all kinds of goodies and medicines. And they might try to take that village and give them some things and make a difference with them. 
a curious anthropologist might go into that village and say, let me see what's already going on here. How are they already getting along? Do they need any outside intervention? Or is it perfect just the way it is? So not interpreting and making decisions about your people and putting them into boxes, but being open as a curious anthropologist to uh, understand them. You're not forming a lot of conclusion, uh, co yeah, co uh, interpreting and forming conclusions about them. So if you, there are five steps that we use when we're on the way to building lifetime clients. First is I've got to build trust by listening and understanding and they have to feel gotten and they have to feel safe and they have to understand that I'm here to help them and I've helped many like them. The second thing, I've got to come up with a mutually beneficial offering that resolves their problem in my deliverable service. Mutually beneficial, not thank you for the contract and the check. I did the least amount of work I could do. Your case is closed. What are you bothering me for? Mutually beneficial is I'm going to show you what we're going to do. I'm going to explain how we're going to do it. We're going to create a common goal to get there. And we're going to resolve this problem with our service. And it's going to be beneficial to you. And then you're going to pay me. So it's going to be beneficial to me. And by the way, there's going to be a third party involved called the IRS and the state. There has to be a mutually beneficial solution that's acceptable to the third party. Number three, I want to create a shared reality by providing a method of measuring what success will look like on our agreement with each other. This uh, friend of mine is a multimillionaire. He cleans most of the hotel windows on all the major properties in the islands of Hawaii. He has 700 employees and makes millions of dollars, been doing the business for 45 years. He's developed a 300-point checklist on how to clean a room. And that checklist was put together with the hotel managers and the housekeeping that says, if the items on this checklist are met, we have a really perfectly clean room. And what happens is, if you're doing a room review with a hotel manager that's checking up on your work and he's in a bad mood, you could get a bad review. If he's in a great mood, you could have an unclean room and get a great review. But there's no question when there's 300 items on a checklist and you go through and check them all off, if you miss three, you've gotten 297. You've got three that you can improve on. If you don't have a mutually agreeable shared method of measuring what success will look like, then your client could be happy, could be unhappy, and could be blissfully unhappy that they've gotten far more than they expected to get. Or they could be complaining, thinking they didn't get what they're supposed to get because you weren't clear on the outset of what you agreed would be a mutually shared method for measuring success. Number four, you deliver the service that you've outlined. Well, you're supposed to, you're getting paid for it. You're gonna be able to measure it, but what could you do differently that would surprise and delight your client? I have a client, they're responsible for a good 30% of my business referrals for the last 16 years. They're a large employee, association group that has 100 million employees under their employee benefits program. Their clients are Boeing and Disney and ABC News and just Fortune 1000 companies. I'm on the panel. Our company's on the panel for 16 years to fix tax problems. So when an employee calls and they go to their EAP and they ask for help, they get referred to my company. Well, that company has been sending me business for a long time. They happen to be located up in Sacramento. I'm in Marin. Once a month, I drive up to Sacramento. I host a big, huge pizza party for all the staff members that are in that bullpen taking all those consultation calls. I break bread with them. I meet them face to face. I tell them how important they are. And I tell them some of the success stories of the people they've given to us that we've resolved. 
Well, I'll tell you, they say, oh, we know Bob's here. We smell the pizza. Let's get out of this cubicle and get in that lunchroom. Mm -hmm. So pizza day is an unexpected delight and surprise. They do not expect it. And they've told me, we have hundreds of people that we send referrals to. Nobody ever comes to see us. They don't even call us and thank us for the referrals. They just expect us to send them to them. Thanks for feeding us, Bob. We love you. You're great. Pass the salad. Number five, feedback. Who defines the level of reality of whether you gave a great 10 out of 10 experience or a two out of 10 experience with your client? Do you define it? Or does your client define it? I will tell you what your client thinks you did is their reality and that's the reality you're with. You've got to figure that out. So if they think you did a four and you think you did a nine, who's right? Your client's experience is the one you have to worry about. There's some interesting facts. 70% of clients who complain about your business will do business with you again if you just address the issue. Don't leave it under the carpet. Don't be afraid of it. 68% of your clients leave because they think you don't care about them when they're interviewed. The average business will not hear a peep from 96% of the unhappy clients. They just leave. And guess what? When they leave, they go tell nine to 20 people how bad the experience was. So if you've got a complaint, boy, oh boy, do you have a beautiful opportunity to resolve it, keep a client and stop that nine to 20 from hearing about how horrible or what they thought you did bad that they perceived was wrong. really, really key, client feedback. If you ask your clients on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate our service with 10 being excellent and perfect and one being horrible, most of the time you'll get that kind of a look because they don't want to say what's really on their mind if they're non-confrontational. And they might give you their first answer. Oh, you guys are pretty good. Oh, pretty good. Excellent. That's great. Listen, on a scale of one to 10, though, 10 being perfect and one being bad, what number would you give us? Mm, him and Hall, they really won't do it. Second question, they'll say, oh, you know, uh, you're about a B minus or a C plus. Oh, great. A, a B minus or a C plus. Excellent. Um, but on a number scale, if you could put it to a number of one to 10, 10 being the best, what number would you say we delivered to you? Mm, they still don't wanna say it. You know, I think you guys were about 80% there. Oh, great, 80%, thank you. Um, I guess that on a scale of one to 10, would that be eight out of 10? Yeah, yeah, eight out of 10. Okay, until you get a number, you cannot define the who, what, where, when, why, and how it could have been better. If you let them give you a non-specific, oh, you're great, under their breath, except for Susie. Susie, I called 11 times, emailed four times, and she didn't even get back and tell me that she was on sick leave and give somebody else to help me. That, that comment won't come up if you don't get the actual scale of one to 10 and then the, the next part is how you respond to their feedback, encouraging them will encourage them to tell you more. If you don't ask, they won't tell. If you don't encourage them, they won't really share the truth. You have to be open to getting feedback. You have to welcome it and you have to encourage it one, two, three, four times in that discussion. And basically, you've got to dig, get this, for what you don't want to hear. What? I don't want to hear complaints about my business. If she said it was fine, why don't I leave well enough and go? 
because you will not discover what you're missing out of getting one to 10 and getting higher and higher and higher on the 10 scale if you don't dig for it. So there is no such thing as negative feedback. If you got a hole in your boat, it's already there, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to know about it? And they're the ones that can tell you where that hole is because they've been sitting over it and the water's coming in. So if you find out what that negative feedback is, you have the opportunity to improve your system. Anyone ever hear of the Deming Award? After World War II, when the US decided to go back to Japan and help them rebuild their damaged world over there, they began at looking at their processes and sending over uh, at, you know, people to consult with them on how to get better and better and better at doing their manufacturing. And one of these guys was Deming. And Deming did a lot of studies in Japan and he realized that when he was finding errors and mistakes in manufacturing and other processes that 80% of the errors that were coming up were systemic errors in the system, not people errors. And so they said, hmm, if you've got something wrong and you're not getting the result you want, don't look at the people, look at the system that they're working in and work on correcting the system. So we rely on people giving us their positive feedback, even though it doesn't sound well, to find little chinks in our system that don't connect quite as well, because I've got the best people, we've trained them the best we can, and if they're not delivering 10 out of 10, there's something in my system that I could improve, and these people know what it is. They're in your system from the receivable end of your deliverable, and if you ask them and you probe them, they will tell you where the little chinks in your system are that would have made it a better experience for them. So kind of in closing, in summary of what we've gone through today, you gotta to build trust. And then you've gotta define a measurable shared expectation that you both agree on. If you measure and point to these things, you have hit what you said you would do and what they wanted. You're gonna to strive to get a 10 out of 10 where does perfection, where's the only place in the world that perfection exists? There's only one place. Any ideas? You can unmute yourself for this. Where does perfection exist in the world? In our heads. It's a good guess. Any others? I thought it was for Claire. Go ahead. Clients. Where does perfection exist? You think it's Nowhere. client? Nowhere. Nowhere. Actually, it does exist one place. It's in the dictionary. <laughs> so when you get client feedback, because you're not perfect and you are 10 out of 10, you're going to see these small changes that you have this beautiful opportunity to implement. And you must, must, must go back and thank them. Susie? You told me that when you called my phone system and it said, press one to reach Bob, that it went, you heard this beautiful music and then you got my voicemail instead of me and you left me a voicemail. I thought I was gonna get Bob. If I have an emergency, I'd like to get Bob or somebody from your company cause it's urgent and that didn't work for me. So when we got that feedback, we got a 24 seven answering service. And we tell clients in the evaluation, this service is on 24 seven, we're not, but it is. And they're trained to take all your information, find out exactly what you think the emergency is, text the owner, myself and my partner, and email us, and we promise, we get one of those, we're gonna get back to you within 24 hours. So if you can have a 24 hour window from three in the morning, we're gonna get back to you. So you can use, we call it the bat phone, 888-999-0744. They answer 24 seven, they get right to the owner's phone and they text me. So if I wake up 
in the middle of the night because something buzzed and I see that, I may decide it's not really an emergency and I can use the 24 hours and go back to sleep. But sometimes I'll just go click, click, click. Susie, you got an IRS notice that it says they're gonna levy your bank. Yes. It scared you and you can't sleep. Yes. Can you look up at the top right? Yes. Does it say CP504? Yes, how did you know? It's a 30 day notice. And what's the date on it? June 17th, great. Can I call you tomorrow and talk about it? We'll schedule the response between now and July 17th. Oh gosh, what time is it where you are? It's three in the morning. Oh my God, I woke you up at three? No, no, I told you I'd respond within 24 hours. I had the option to do either or. I, I, I was up, I looked at it, it took two minutes to fix. You're, it's important, I don't want you to lose sleep over it. Can you go back to sleep now? We got 30 days to deal with it. <gasps> oh, Bob, thank you. I don't always answer at three in the morning. Most of the time I wait till the next morning and respond within 24 hours. But if you tell somebody you can respond in 24 hours and that's the agreement on the deliverable and they can reach a human 24 seven, I pay a dollar a minute for the phone calls to the answering service. It's worth $100,000 a year in lost business for that dollar a minute because they're never out of touch. And after they call once and test it, and it's a stupid thing, and it didn't really, when it was an emergency, guess what they do? They call the next day, or they email, or they take a deep breath, and it's not as emergent as they thought. Now, find ways to surprise and delight your clients. It, when you're interviewing your clients and you're finding out about them, you can ask things like, what do you do when you're not working? Oh, you knit. Oh, you ride horses, you golf, you do this, you do that. My friend, the multimillionaire with the 700 employees and all the hotels, he takes his biggest clients out and does things like marlin fishing over on the big island. One of his biggest clients in Europe, who he manufactures his own cleaning equipment and this European company buys it from them, one of his biggest potential buyers in Europe came over to check out the equipment and the operation in Hawaii years ago, and he took them out marlin fishing. Guess what? They caught a marlin. And you bring them in and they take a picture next to it and then you leave the island and you never see anything again. About two months later, a delivery comes to the guy's corporate office in England. And here's this nine foot marlin stuffed with a plaque ready to go on the wall with a picture of them on the bottom together there. It's up on his desk. It's been behind his desk for 15 years. Guess what he says every time somebody says, wow, did you catch that? Yeah, me and my buddy Bill went out marlin fishing and the guy sent this to me. Can you believe it? Well, you know, if a guy's doing hundreds of thousands and potentially millions of dollars a year in business with you and he happens to like fishing, and you do something to surprise and delight him, that is amazing. The other thing that Bill told me, and I love this story, he says, when I was courting my third wife, who he's still married to now, he goes, I wouldn't send her a dozen roses, I would send her seven dozen roses, because nobody sends seven dozen roses. And that made a big impression on her because she loves roses. Surprise and delight. Doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be small. It does have to be personal. Anyone know Mike Macedonio? Anyone know Don Lyons? What was uh, uh, Mike's biggest referral that he's most grateful for? Don was referred to him and she was referred back to him. And so they were mutually referred and they end up marrying. We kind of found out that Don likes the color purple. So he started doing things around purple for Don because he knew that's what she really liked. Surprise and delight. So uh, in closing for the presentation, I love this question. When it was asked of me and everyone, every time I think about it in a quiet space, I always write some things down that I'm a little scared of writing. What actions don't I take that would transform my life beyond my wildest dreams? That's a great question. 
they usually have to do with facing your tiger, the thing that you're most afraid of, that you hope doesn't jump out of the bush and get you. And I want to thank uh, my friend Bill Allen for providing a lot of the detail and the stuff that's in here. I He's one of my mentors. I go to many of his workshops and uh, uh, consult with him often. He happens to be my best friend since I was 18 years old. I'm 64. And a lot of the material is credited to Bill. So now I want to open it up to questions. How much time do we have left, Bob? Oh, well, we have a half an hour. So I'm going to conclude the recorded part of the presentation and then we can